Welcome to this talk about our ISCA 24 paper, a set scalpel for lattice surgery, representation and synthesis of subroutines for surface code for tolerant quantum computing. I'm Daniel Tan, and this is a joint work with Murphy New and Brad Gidney, while I was a student researcher at Google Quantum AI. Separately, I'm also a PhD candidate at University of California, Los Angeles, and Murphy is a professor at University of California, Santa Barbara. This talk is going to include three parts. In the first part, I'm going to survey the high-level ideas of this paper, paper and uh, the slides is, is going to be exactly the same with what used in the ISCA24 pre presentation. In the second part, I'm going to go over the figures of the paper to talk about technical details. And in the third part, I'm going to have a look at the code repo that we have uh, uploaded to Zenodo. And uh, it will also be a part of Steam, the stabilizer simulation framework by Craig. So let's enter the first part. Maybe you have already noticed that this is an extremely long paper title, and that is because I feel obliged to mention a few key assumptions of this work. Let's review these assumptions on different levels of the photon quantum computing stack. On the lowest level, we have the physical qubit and the coupler. In this picture, we have uh, from IBM, um, there's a superconducting qubit, this square and uh, two bars with a little gap in the middle. And this winding structure is a coupler between two qubits. You need a coupler to be able to interact these two qubits. And the easiest setting for fabrication will be to the nearest neighbor connectivity. And uh, this type of connectivity, uh, it turns out that there is a quantum error question code that is very nice uh, to implement on this type of connectivity, which is the surface code. We need quantum error correction because without it, we cannot control the errors that are happening all the time on a quantum computer. Uh, and the noise level is also way higher than uh, conventional semiconductor. So a large scale quantum computing cannot survive with quantum error correction code. The second figure, it is as if we have zoomed out from the first figure. My representation here is that each data qubit is a circle and each ancillary qubit or called a metric qubit is a dot. Both of these are physical qubits. They're made, of, made from the same material, uh, but they have different jobs. The data qubits, the circles, they will hold the quantum information that we're computing with. The ancillary qubits or the metric qubits, they are measuring some what we call stabilizers of the surface code. In this paper, we use the color coding RGB to XYZ. So R red means X. For example, this red face, uh, red face is a four body X stabilizer. So um, the ancillary qubit will interact with this data qubit, this and this and this, and the measurement result will be the x, 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 x. That's a parity of four x operators on four data qubits. RGB means x, y, z, so blue means z, and this ancillary qubit is measuring a two-body z operator on these two qubits. This um, this lattice can extend in a 2D plane, and um, we need to define some structures on them to perform computation. The basic unit of computation in the surface code uh, in the surface code computation is a tile, which is a square d by d data qubits. Here, d is three, and uh, uh, we have two types of boundaries. Um, uh, actually, when we split the lattice in this way, um, when there is 
a boundary stepping onto some of this, uh, I say like qubits, uh, you need to adjust the stabilizer on them. Um, so for example, on this leftmost boundary, you see that it's stepping onto this CZ stabilizer, and that is correct because on the boundary should be two body instead of four body. So uh, actually what happens when we split this uh, cubic qubits into these tiles is that we will not turn on the um, the XX stabilizer on these two qubits and then we'll make this uh, four body Z into a two body like on the left boundary. So the color of the boundary is the color of the this two body stabilizer it is stepping on. So the topmost boundary is stepping on the red or the X stabilizer. So it's a red boundary. And the color on the left and right are the Z boundaries. One of these tiles on its own is can be a logical qubit. So it can encode one qubit amount of information. And uh, specifically in this example, it will be a surface code qubit, a logical qubit of distance three. After we have our basic unit and we want to com perform computation on this basic unit, our scheme of performing for tolerance computing is called lattice surgery. Specifically, this is the scheme of interacting multiple tiles. And there are also some single tile computation and those will be restricted to a single tile, so uh, which are less uh, interesting. Uh, so we say our computing scheme is lattice surgery. So what's shown here is what we call the Z merge. Why it's called a Z merge? Because it's, it's a merge of two tiles. So in this figure time goes from below to the top. And before each layer of operation, we'll have the QEC round. So in each QEC round, the ancilla qubits will interact with its neighbors and measure those parities, measure those stabilizers. Um, and uh, in the middle here, we have a non-trivial operation. It's a Z-merge uh, because the neighboring boundaries are of the blue type and blue is Z. So it is merging these two tiles on the Z boundary. And then uh, after the merge, they will become a non-square patch of surface code. There is a notion of a result of the merge and that will be the product of all the uh, ancilla qubit measurement result I draw here. That product is going to be plus one or minus one and that is actually performing an XX measurement on the logical level of these two tiles. One thing you can notice is that we have drawn this time dimension in this figure. And these boundaries, red or blue boundaries, when they sweep through time, they look like pipe. So this whole figure looks like two narrower pipes merged to a wider pipe. And this, uh, pipe intuition uh, is going to be our, what, what we'll be considering later on. And this Z-merge, it only implements, as I said, uh, XX measurement, and that is a very small operation for the whole quantum algorithm. Usually we need to decompose the operations into Clifford plus T set, or you can choose some other magic state uh, but you need to decompose it somehow, and then um, you need to implement this decomposed gates 
with lattice surgery. For example, in a CNOT gate, we can do it with uh, ion sealer qubit initialized with zero state, and then we have the x-axis -X measurement. Uh, note that these are on the logical level, and then uh, apply some Z gate correction, and then a few other of these operations. And this whole thing, this Z merge, can be part of this MXX operation. However, in this paper, we are actually not going to follow this conventional approach of um, decomposing into Clifford gates and uh, T gates. Act uh, actually, we're going to try to synthesize a subroutine larger than just one gate, maybe it corresponds to 10 to 20 gates. And we are going to synthesize it directly with um, lattice surgery operations like this. And then that, that's where the benefit comes from. So a little comparison with the previous work. Um, the most famous one is probably this game of surface code paper. And this picture is taken from there. And uh, it is actually a uh, um, state distillation, T state distillation factory. You have the time steps. So uh, you can see that they are also doing this computation in these tiles. And then you have um, tiles can merge with other tiles to like not uh, irregular patches and it is drawing the key frames of this computation. And there's also Azure's resource estimator uh, is from Microsoft and inside this resource estimator is a huge project. There are some parts that correspond to what we're doing here. The main difference with this previous work is that they are implementing this computation on some fixed uh, recipes. And those recipes are guided by human intuition. And of course, they are mathematically correct. In comparison, what we're trying to do in this project is that we are trying to exhaustively search for the space time uh, in the space time uh, via set. So that satisfiability, uh, we use some set solvers to, for this problem. And this is one of the outputs of our tool. It is a majority gate design. And our tool is called a SINS. As you can see, this uh, structure is highly non-trivial. And uh, sometimes when you, you can, of course, go back to each layer of operation and trying to try to prove it. But you soon find out that it is hardly possible to do this with a human intuition. Um, it is doing some very tricky stuff. And um, one of one of the reasons is that um, the previous works usually have fixed region of ancilla tiles. So in this uh, distillation factory by Game of Surface Code, the middle row the, these four tiles, these are ancilla regions. And uh, all the ancillas, for example, this two by one ancilla and this four by one ancilla, uh, but all the ancilla are in this region and this region is only used for ancilla. However, in the design generated by our two, it, the ancilla is very flexible. You can initialize and recycle ancilla anywhere any time in the space-time volume. Um, and also, our generated results are correct by construction because we built in the constraints of designing this uh, lattice surgery subroutines in the set instance. Um, whereas even for human experts, you can make errors from time to time. Uh, actually. This uh, major we we try to encode a previous human expert design of the majority gate with our representation and uh, check it with our tool, and we found that it is incorrect. 
um, and visually you can see that um, this previous work they have uh, generated this 2D time slices and our two can export to the 3D pipes. This is uh, rendered from uh, this, this file is rendered from a modeling file and the modeling file is directly generated from the output of our compiler. And we can also uh, export to ZX diagrams and so on. As a summary, the previous works, they try, they aim to be end to end and uh, they are more like Swiss army knife. You can throw any quantum algorithm at them and they're trying to uh, compile it and maybe do some resource estimation. Our work focus on frequently used subroutine and that is also a result of the exhaustive nature via set solver. So we cannot handle too large subroutines. Um, that's why we call it a scalpel in the title instead of Swiss army knife. And this can be used in combination with a higher level compiler. For example, it will uh, assign some limited space time and slice this subroutine for us. And then we can synthesize with our tool. Okay, so I'll give a bit of a uh, taste of the formulation, uh, which are the variables and constraints in our model. We use a 3D coordinate, IJK. We refrain from using XYZ because there are so many XYZs in quantum computing already. Um, so I and J, these are the two spatial dimension and K is the time dimension. We, so our computation process, it consists of all these pipes and uh, to be exhaustive, we must we must allow a pipe to possibly appear at each possible um, time and space. And um, our encoding is that each three degree points correspond to a cube. So this cube uh, is d by d physical cube is going through d rounds of our correction. So that is what is happening between two layers of operation. And that is always happening, regardless what the operation is. Um, and so then between the cubes, that's where the computation happens. Um, and each cube has six neighbors. So we split these pipes connecting the cubes into I, J, and K. Um, the I and J pipes, these are by the surgery merge and split. For example, this pipe between these two cube, that means I will first merge these two tiles. And then uh, after the rounds of our correction, I will split them. So that's the horizontal pipes, the I and J pipes, the K pipes, uh, or rather the continuation or termination of the K-pipes means initialization and measurement of the tiles. For example, in this middle column, uh, as you can see, the other two pillars, they have uh, K-pipes at the bottom, but there is no bottom K-pipe for the middle column. So that actually means after some time, this tile is initialized, right? Before the time, since there's no K-pipe, it, it doesn't exist. And after some time, it terminate, right? You can see there are two K-pipes here, but there's no K-pipe here. And that means uh, this tile is measured. We have one bit for each possible K-pipes. Um, so if there is a pipe between cube i, j, k and i, j, k plus one, that base is going to be one, like I marked in this figure. Otherwise, the variable is going to be zero. So all the other missing k pipes, those are going to be zero. For the pipe, uh, you can see two sides are red, two sides are blue. 
So if you rotate it by 90 degree in a, with respect to the x axis, it's uh, going to be a different configuration. So we also have two arrays of variables for the color or the orientation of the IJ pipes. We don't have uh, this variable for the K pipes and uh, uh, that is a bit technical. And we'll mention it later on in the second part. First, we have some validity constraints built from this color and exist variables. My example is color matching and uh, um, this is specifically for what we call a pass through. Um, that means if you have two pipes in the same direction, um, so it's like a passing through some cube, then the color orientation variable of these two pipes must be the same. So you, you can have blues, both blue sides facing to you or both red sides facing to you, but you cannot have one pipe blue faces, blue face facing to you and the other pipe uh, with red faces. Written in uh, more formally, uh, for example, we have these two pipes in the I direction. So one is from 0, 1, 2 to 1, 1, 2, and one is from 1, 1, 2 to 2, 1, 2. Uh, they, they form a pass-through. So this, this pipe can exist or or, or doesn't if any one of these two pipes doesn't exist, then the left part will be false and the, tr the whole statement according to Boolean logic will be true. However, when these two exist variables are both one, that means both pipes exist, then we need the second half of the proposition, which is the color variables should be the same. And there are other arrays of uh, constraints. Uh, we're going to go over them in the second part. However, these validity constraints, these are not the dominating number of constraints and variables in, the, um, in this formulation. Uh, what's more important are the correlation surface variables and constraints. And uh, this, ensure the function of the subroutine because the validity constraint there only makes sure that when you build up these pipes, it's valid. It doesn't mean that it will do what you want it to do. Um, to check the function, you need to um, construct correlation surface for each of the stabilizer of the subroutine. So for a C naught, you have four stabilizers, IX to IX, XI to XX, IZ to ZZ, ZI to ZI. So you have uh, four arrays of this correlation surface variables compared to one array, uh, compared to exists IJK and the color IJ. And on high level, these correlation surfaces are traveling inside the pipes, and we are going to draw them with this half transparent um, surfaces. And they have boundary conditions, which are um, at the ports, those are the open-ended pipes in this figure. There are four ports, there are four on, uh, two on the bottom, two on the top. On the boundary, uh, which are the, this, ports, um, we have to be the same with uh, what we specify in this stabilizer of the subroutine. And locally, uh, when the correlation surfaces are traveling inside the pipes, you have some propagation loss in the uh, at all the junctions. So for T junction, you have a few options depending on the orientation of this correlation surfaces. We're going to talk about this in more detail in the second part. So um, let's take a look at the software construction. 
Uh, first, we have the input specification. This includes the allowed volume, the length, the width, the height of this subroutine, uh, and location of the ports, which are the open-ended pipes, and uh, the stabilizers to satisfy of this subroutine, which specify the function of the subroutine. We give it to a formulation script, and we use Boolean variables and Boolean logic to construct this uh, set problem. And then we use a set solver to solve that set instance. There are two possibilities. Either the result is satisfiable, then the solver provides a satisfying solution, which then will uh, provide all the value assignments of those variables I mentioned in the last slide. In this case, you may continue to optimize this subroutine by reducing the solution with uh, with solution space with some extra constraints. For example, you may uh, remove the possibility of having pipes in the top layer so that you have a smaller volume uh, for a smaller volume set problem and then solve again. The other possibility from the set solver is that it is unsatisfiable, then set solver will not provide you a solution. That means there is no solution whatsoever in the current design space. So in this case, you may increase the solution space and then try to find a solution. But it can also be that you have previously, you already have some set results and then you keep reducing the solution space until there's an unset. By this point, you know that it is optimal up to your route of optimizing, uh, of, of reducing the solution space. So then you don't need to um, increase the solution space again because you know you're at the optimal solution. Okay, so maybe some of you have already noticed that um, when we are characterizing these subroutines with a set of stabilizers, that means the subroutine is essentially Clifford. And Clifford is the non-interesting kind of computation in quantum computing. So how do we handle non-Cliffordness with this work? And the answer is actually quite simple. We just filter out the non-Clifford as ports and uh, the rest can be characterized by the stabilizers. And these ports, we, we just input a non-Clifford resource from other part of the quantum computer where this non Clifford um, is generated. For example, this is a ZX diagram of the majority gate, and we have filtered out a non Clifford resource CCZ. And then there are also some other six ports. So these are uh, these are these are also ports in the pipe diagram. Um, and interestingly, so I said the non clever resource is generated somewhere else on the computer, but you may ask, so then you're just delegating the problem to this other part. So how are you going to design that other part? Um, for example, this is a 15 to one T distillation factory. It turns out that for this factory, it is generating the T state that we provide to other parts of the computer. Um, but when we, we can also filter out the non-Clifford in this, in this subroutine. And once we do that, uh, we're left with something Clifford. So uh, I think specifically for this factory, uh, before all these T dagger operations, you have uh, an encoder of a uh, read model code and that encoder, uh, it is Clifford. So we can also just filter out the non-Clifford part and then we use our uh, synthesizer and we actually manage to optimize the T factory. So let's look at some key results uh, for this majority gate we have 40% less volume compared to uh, this work. And actually, I, I think I mentioned previously, we try to check the 
design in this work and it's incorrect. For the 15 to 1 T factory, we decrease 8% of the space time volume. And under some other assumptions, uh, we have a different baseline. And uh, with the same assumption in this work, we have an 18% decrease in space time volume. So as a summary to the first part, we define a specification of lighter surgery subroutine. We define the representation of the of last, we call it laser. So those are the binary variables in the formulation. We develop an optimal synthesizer for last called LASINS by encoding the synthesis problem to a set instance. And of course, this notion of optimality, there, there are some assumptions, for example, the code distance should remain constant through the subroutine. That's why we can um, formulate this pipe diagrams in a very regular space. You know, the, 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 the dimension of the cubes and pipes are the same everywhere. And also we need to stick to the primitive operations in the figure two of the paper. So you may throw in some other highly non-trivial operations, then your uh, results can change. Um, so the since speed human experts in some last design problems like T factory, the majority gate, and uh, just for education purpose, it can generate the 3D models for inspection, which uh, I haven't seen anyone do it automatically previously. The since is uh, not intended to be an end-to-end -end compiler because we rely on set solver and you cannot expect to solve arbitrary large problems. It's not polynomial runtime. So it can be used as a component in a higher level compiler for real experiment or research estimation and so on. These are some of the key references mentioned earlier. And this marks the end of our first part. Now it comes to the second part of the talk, the technical details. And we're just going to be going over all the figures. So first are the fault tolerant operations that are considered. Uh, you have some single tile operations. Uh, as a reminder, each tile uh, is a D by D data qubit, and you have uh, different type of boundaries depending on the stabilizers. On the boundaries, you have X boundaries, which are red, Z boundaries, which are blue. And we also have the X and Z logical operators of this tile. Uh, the X operator uh, connects the two X boundaries, the Z operator connects the two Z boundaries. To initialize this tile into logical zero, you just initialize everything into zero. Uh, you can initialize into plus also, similarly. To measure the logical Z, you just measure Z on all of the data qubits, and then you take the product of the Zs, uh, and the X. Oh, I may actually made a little arrow here. Okay. Um. Anyway, um, we also have this domain wall operation, which is uh less non-trivial. It is um, performing a physical hardware on all of the data qubits. And then uh, this little arrow means we need to swap them because the um, when the tiles align, there's a, like, uh, a little bit difference when you um, change the orientation. You change the blue, tile, uh, the blue boundaries to uh, horizontal and the uh, red boundaries for vertical. Like You need to shift it a little. So this domain wall operation, um, it would it would change the boundary, uh, or like the color orientation variable of the of the pipes, and uh, it is represented by a yellow ring in the pipe diagrams. There are also also some Y basis operations, uh, and um, this is just a sketch of the case for three by three. And uh, this will take half code distance that many rounds. And these are 
represented by green because we are color coding RGB to XYZ. Uh, half distance green boxes in the pipes. And uh, we just take this from some existing literature and you will come check the paper for the reference. The more important assumption is our multi qubit operation, which um, are, which is lattice survey. Uh, but specifically, we uh, consider this operation called merge split. So you have, for example, you have two tiles. Uh, you first merge them, and then you get the result of the merge, uh, either plus or minus one. And then you go through D rounds of QEC, and then you split them. So we always merge D rounds of our correction and split. Um, you can, you don't have to split after D rounds of uh, QEC, but we feel that it is, um, it doesn't lose any generality when you restrict your, uh, when you restrict your focus to this operation. And this merge split exactly corresponds to the horizontal pipes in the pipe diagrams. That's why we chose to do so. Uh, in the simplified representation of tiles, uh, a merge split is like this. You can see you first uh, merge, and then the state will be a merged patch, longer patch, and then you split, and then you have two tiles again. Um, we don't go beyond this set of operations in our formulation. So as I said, it is one of the key assumptions of the optimality. If you have some specific operations in mind that go beyond this set, then maybe you can do better. And uh, maybe you can also extend our formulation to include such operations. This is our specification for lighter service subroutine last. Um, you have max i, max j, max k. These are the bounds of the three dimensions. And then you have a list of ports. So each port is an open-ended pipe. Um, it has a location, which is a tuple of three integers. That's the, um, that is the cube that is not there. For example, for this pipe in the top left, you have i equals to one, j equals to zero, k equals to three. So this is the open-ended, this is the open end of that pipe. And uh, if it's not open-ended, then there should be a, a cube here, but it's not here. So that is the locate definition of the location of the port. And the direction is a two character string the first character is either plus or minus, and the second one is i or j or k. That is a direction from this open end to the other end of the pipe. So in this example, we have minus k because you go to in the k direction and you go down, you go to the other end. And finally, we have the z basis direction. It can be either I or J or K. That is the I or J or K that is uh, perpendicular to the Z faces. So Z faces are are blue, and in this case, it is uh, it is perpendicular to the J axis. So Z basis direction is J for this port. We have four ports in total for this CNAT example. And uh, finally, we have the stabilizers of this last. Uh, for CNAT, you have four stabilizers. And uh, each stabilizer depends on how you index these four ports. Um, and each stabilizer is a polystring. Um, with the length the same as the number of ports, and uh, each poly in the poly string can be i or x, y or, y or z. We use a dot for identity. 
And as a reminder, these are stabilizers on the logical level to describe what the subroutine is doing logically. It is not to be confused with the physical level stabilizers for quantum error correction. Okay, so we have seen some of this representation previously, but let's just uh, look into this synod example in more detail. Um, in the 2D time slices, we have uh, three tiles. We have the control tile C, the target tile T, and the ancilla tile A. Um, and like I said, when you sweep these boundaries in time, uh, you, you get these pipes. And literally, it is, uh, if you do that literally, you will get diagrams like uh, this two. Um, the problem with this, this exact in scale diagram is that the non-trivial operations like the merges and the splits, so this are in this tiny, tiny gap between the cubes and it's not very visible. Um, so we kind of elongate the distance between neighboring cubes and that's when we have this uh, pipe diagram. Specifically, we have um, two units of lens uh, for the pipe compared to the cube. Um, so this is not what literally happens on the chip because um, when, when, you, when you do that, actually these pipes are this, in this very narrow gap. Uh, but if you literally do this, it is also the same because of the topological features of the service code. Um, on this time axis, I have marked the different moments corresponding to the 2D time slices. And uh, I also have the circuit version of the C0 gate here. Um, so at moment zero, you have control and target tiles. Maybe they have been operated by some other subroutines, uh, whatever. In moment one, you have a blue solid phase that is the bottom floor of this cube. And that actually means uh, initializing everything in uh, zero state. Uh, and also you initiate the first merge split by merging the two, the target and the ancilla patch. So in the circuit language, you uh, moment one is actually both initialization and then the start of the MXX. At moment two, uh, you kind of cut in the middle uh, that those two tiles have been merged and it's doing Q rounds of error correction. Uh, so nothing non-trivial happens here. And at moment three, you finish the merge split operation by splitting these two tiles again. Um, yeah, so in the circuit language, that corresponds to the finishing point of the MXX. And then you have a merge split between ancilla and the control tile again from moment five to seven. Uh, and uh, it's on a different type of boundary. So then that is no longer an MXX, it's an MZZ. And also at moment seven, you have a solid red phase. That means measuring all the data qubits of this ancilla tile in X basis. Um, so moment seven is both the finishing point of MZZ, but it also measure the ancilla in X basis. So it is not a moment in the circuit diagram, but rather a few things combined. Uh, and you notice that I have drawn the uh, feedback gates, poly gates in gray. That's because uh, you can perform those in the control software of the quantum uh, of a quantum quantum computer. You don't need to literally apply those 
And uh, also in the pipe diagram, you don't see that uh, feedback gate uh, because this 3D pipe diagram is exactly what happens on chip and uh, this uh, feedback gates can be applied off chip in the class of control software. Secretly, these pipe diagrams also have a very direct correspondence with ZX diagram. Uh, if you don't know ZX diagrams, uh, here is a quick introduction. You have uh, spiders, which are the nodes in this diagram. You can have um, two types of spiders, Z spiders and X spiders. Our color coding here may be a little bit different from conventional color coding. Um, so basically, uh, when you have this node and then you have a parameter that is called the face of the spider, uh, if it's a solid, it means zero plus e to the i alpha one. And then if it's a circle, then you, it's in the other basis. These spiders can have arbitrary many input uh, legs. And uh, if you interpret this diagram as you go from left to right, then what's on the left is the input, what's on the right are the outputs. So then you have the corresponding dimensions of the input and output uh, as uh, the algebra. Um, there are some rewrite rules that you can apply on these diagrams. For example, when you have two spiders of the same type connecting by a single wire uh, and they have alpha and beta faces, then you can actually combine those to a spider taking all the inputs and outputs of these two spiders and then you combine the face. And uh, if you have integer uh, pi faces, uh, you can sometimes exchange the order of different uh, different type of spiders. So these are just example rewrite rules. There are many rules. I'm not going to go over them uh, because we we don't need that uh, for now. How do you map this pipe diagram to a ZX diagram? It's quite easy. When you have uh, a red, a red T or a red cross, those are the junctions of the pipe. Uh, so that because the color red, which corresponds to X, is drawing this T or this cross junction, we map it to an X spider. Those are the circles. And when you have a blue junction, you map it to a Z uh, spider. That is the solid dot again. RGB is color coded to XYZ in our paper. And uh, so those are for three or four way junctions. When you have a, just a turn or a straight pass through, uh, that actually doesn't matter because it's a property that um, the either is Z spider or X spider, if it only has two legs, uh, it doesn't matter uh, when its face is zero. So when you piece together, so each cube will correspond to one spider, although some of those are trivial. Um, and we don't have face to any of these spiders so far. Um, so when you map each cube to a spider and then you connect everything with the the edges. Uh, and you can see that this is the CNAL diagram of uh, uh, in the ZX language. Notice that we our color coding again is Z spider is solid dot and X spider is circle. And you can prove this by applying um, the algebra identities we set up on the left hand. So you first have a one input, two output Z spider, and then you have a two um, input, one output X spider. 
Sorry. Okay, so these pipes, um, we, we have seen that they can be interpreted by slicing into 2D time slices. And then also you can interpret it as a ZX diagram. Um, so now let's look at specifically the structural variables. You have uh, so we have five, uh, I think six arrays. One is Y cube, so that is special because it's tied to each cube, not to each pipe. So for each cube, a Y cube just means that whether it is the Y basis operation, those again, those will be the half distance green boxes. And we don't have any in this figure. So all the vacuum variables are zero for this in out uh, design. And then we have the three exist variable uh, array of variables. We have exist i, and uh, that is the i pipe starting from ijk to i plus one jk. So for for this cube, it's i. Uh, its coordinate is 0, 1, 2. And uh, the i pipe 0, 1, 2 will be from this cube to 1, 1, 2. So we increase one unit in the i axis. And apparently there is a pipe. So that exists i 0, 1, 2 variable will be 1. Um, and uh, for example, uh, Another example is when you move this down a unit, you see that there's no I pipe from 0, 1, 1 to 1, 1, 1. So exist I 0, 1, 1 will be 0. Um, OK, and you have the J pipe. I'm not going to cover this example again. Uh, you can do this as a practice. The I and J pipes, these are the merge split operations. For the K pipe, let's see uh, this cube, you have one, one, one as the coordinate, and then you increase by one unit. So from one, one, one to one, one, two, that is the pipe corresponding to exist K, one, one, one. And apparently there is this K pipe, so that variable is going to be one. We have a lot of k-pipes here in this diagram, and some others are zero. Like the, um, when you shift up one unit from this 111 k-pipe or shift down unit, uh, both cases, there are no k-pipes. So those variables are zero. And uh, we have two arrays of orientation for, e uh, for the i and j-pipes. This, our, this is our color convention. Um, because you have to set up a convention, uh, there are only two, two cases of, of this color orientation. And uh, um, yeah, so this is our convention. OK, so with the structural variables, we have the structural constraints, or I think I also call it validity constraints. Um, for example, there's no fan out. So each uh, open end, uh, you cannot have like two, two pipes connecting to the same queue. Uh, that is, we, we don't allow that because we don't really know what it corresponds to. And of course, we specify a few ports explicitly in the specification. So we don't, we don't, we cannot have other open-ended pipes than those specified ports. Um, for this Y basis operations, you can only do it in time because it's uh, it's some process that will take uh, half of distance that many rounds. Um, so this is our, uh, I think this is actually our first time seeing this. Uh, uh, y box, which are half distance green boxes. Um, and you can actually do this for both a pipe connecting upwards and a pipe connecting downwards because um, 
because it's half distance. So you may have some other regular cubes at the same layer, um, but you can do this. Uh, we don't allow what's called 3D corners. So 3D corners just means there is a cube connecting to both three directions. And uh, we can actually deduce that from the matching color constraints later on. But this no 3D corner result um, have a consequence, which is um, our, so for each cube at most there are six pipes coming from it. And uh, since we forbid this 3D corner, it can only, uh, you can be uh, uh, two, there, there can be two pipes, one, uh, one pipe, two pipes, three pipes, four pipes, but there cannot be five or more because that just by the pigeonhole principle, if you have five or more, you must have a 3D corner. And also we say that there's no degree one non-Y cube. So a Y cube, it is uh, possible to have degree one, but for a regular cube, we forbid it to be degree one. That is, uh, that is more like an optimization compared to constraint because um, this type of structure doesn't do anything. We can always just squeeze down this cube to the pipe. Uh, the, matric, uh, the match color constraints, you have two cases versus what I call pass through. This, if you have two, um, you have a two pipes in the same direction, there's a regular cube in the middle, then you should be the same, you should be in the same color orientation. And then you also have a match color turn, which is uh, if you have also two pipes connecting to the same cube, and they're touching on one face, then the faces that are touching should have the same color. And if you have more than two, uh, if I have more than two pipes connecting to this queue, each of the subset that is uh, in this case must satisfy this constraint also. So this applies to cubes with more than two neighbors. And uh, these constraints are just reason from the requirement of performing the ladder surgery. Like you need the two um, same type of boundary to be neighboring to perform ladder survey. Otherwise it's not a valid operation on these two qubits and you don't really know what will happen. So those are the validity constraints. Um, they are not about what this subroutine will do. They are about whether this subroutine is valid. To reason about the function of subroutines, we need to introduce this correlation surface notion. And it is not something entirely new. We've cited some sources in the paper. Um, so these are represented by the half transparent structure traveling inside the pipe in the paper. Um, the first notion we need to define is what we call normal direction. So this is a consequence of some validity constraints. Like I said, you cannot have a 3D corner. That means there must be some direction, I or J or K, uh, where the all the pipes connecting in that junction is orthogonal to that direction. For example, in this uh, in, in this little structure, you have uh, normal direction is pointing out of the paper. Um, and this direction must exist because otherwise you have a pipe in each of the directions of that junction and then that junction will be a 3D corner, which is forbidden. So we can always find the normal direction of, uh, of a junction. And uh, this correlation surface, uh, 
the constraints for each local junction depends on whether that surface is orthogonal to the normal direction or it is parallel to the normal direction. In figure C, we show the case where it is orthogonal. And when it is orthogonal, it is either missing from all the pipes to this junction, or it is present in all of the pipes to this junction. Um, the lower row of figures, this show the example of a uh, correlation surface that are parallel to the normal direction. And when they are parallel, you have the parity constraint. For each, uh, for all the pipes in the junction, you have an even number of parallel co uh, correlation surfaces. So um, you can have, for example, we can have two correlation surfaces. Uh, oh, this, oh, we are actually considering this uh, T junction. So you can have the uh, the T junction, of course, has three pipes, and then you can have two of them being occupied by the collision surface, and one of them is empty. You can also have the other two, or you can have these two. Um, you can also just have none of the pipes have collision surface. Then that will be zero. That is also valid. And if you piece together some of this uh, correlation surface in local junctions, you get the whole correlation surface. And uh, in figure A, we piece together part C. That's the case in this T junction with part G. Would, uh, so these two parts are stitched over this uh, ZA operator that's connecting the two blue faces of the pipe. Okay, so we talk about the, the rule of the color surface, but what do they mean? Each correlation surface just means that all the quantum operator it touches and all the classical measurement results it touches. So if you multiply all of this, it should be one. Um, in the example of part C, you have the Z operator, quantum operator of the target target tile. Uh, and you also have this ZT prime, which is like that operator in later time. Um, you have the quantum operator um, of the ancilla when it's being initialized, but we initialize it deter deterministically to state zero. So that value is actually just one. And then you have that uh, Z operator for the ancilla in a later time. Uh, and also whenever the car, uh, whenever there's a top floor of the horizontal pipe that corresponds to some measurement because you're finishing a merge split and then uh, there will be some measurement. And that measurement result is, uh, we call it B. So this correlation surface just means that ZT prime times ZA times B times ZT should be one. And uh, for part G, you also have ZC prime and ZA and this um, top floor measurement. So this, this three multiplied together should be one. So, and you can see that you have ZA at, uh, in part G and you also have ZA in part C. So if you multiply those together, ZA cancels. That's, that's how we stitch over ZA. What you're left with are ZT prime ZC prime and ZT in the beginning. And of course, there are some of these uh, measurement results. It's the B and this uh, wiggly line. 
Okay, and uh, what does that mean? That means ZT prime, ZC prime, ZT, the product of these three should be the product of the measurement results, the B and this squiggly line. And uh, the definition of a C naught include a stabilizer when you have the identity on the target uh, on the control and Z on the target, it should be identity on the control in the output and uh, Z on the control output and also Z in the target output. That is one of the four stabilizers to define a C naught. So this coalition surface proves that this that the surgery subroutine we build with the pipes satisfy one of the stabilizers of the C naught. And uh, of course, the, there's this uh, classical measurement results which are uh, non-deterministic, but um, so that uh, that is actually why we call it a correlation surface instead of maybe a stabilizer surface because it just means a correlation. There is, it is up to a sign which is the product of all the measurement. These are non-deterministic, so that's the best we can do. We only know it's up to a sign. So this is for the stabilizer IZZZ, and then you need the other three stabilizers to prove that this subroutine indeed implements a C naught. And when we are doing the experiment, we actually need the this correlation surface as well. It's not just verifying that we are implementing the correct function. We also need it in the experiment because, as I said, uh, we only know that the this subroutine implements the stabilizers up to a sign which are the measurement results. And we need, uh, in the experiment, we need to know what are these measurement results to consider to have the final fixes to correct the sign possibly. Okay, and um, I think by this point, if you followed all of the slides, it's probably pretty obvious how we will encode this correlation surface. Um, so inside each, for each stabilizer, inside each pipe, we can have two possible uh, correlation surface pieces. Um, they can connect the blue faces or they can connect the red faces. So we have two possible piece per pipe, and then we have three possible directions for each pipe. So in the end, we have six arrays of Boolean variables to encode the existence of the correlation surface. And this is for each stabilizer. We have to do it for all the stabilizers provided in the specification. Okay, so let's go over some examples. Maybe this one, uh, that's from the, the port at zero, um, one, zero, zero. So the, the later three index indices, one, zero, zero, these are the pipe. So it's a pipe, it's a K pipe from one zero zero to one zero one. And also the first index, that is the index of the stabilizer in the specification. So we're checking some specific stabilizer with this, these variables and that is the index of stabilizer you have. So in this example, there will be, the first index can be zero, one, two, and three, because we have four stabilizers for the C naught. Um, and the first, uh, so core means correlation surface, and the first letter K means the pipe direction. This is a K pipe, so the first letter is K, and uh, 
and the second one, um, so the second one cannot be the same with the first one because the two letters combined together means uh, the, uh, the orientation of that piece of correlation surface. So Ki means the it is the correlation surface with a span by K and I direction. Uh, as you can see in this example, there is no such piece. Um, in contrast, you have a piece spanned by K and J direction. So core KJ at this point is one, whereas core KI is zero. And let's look at another example, maybe, maybe here. We have core I and the last three indices are zero, one, two. Let's see, it is uh, in the I pipe from zero, one, two to one, one, two. Okay. And then the Cartesian surface in this pipe is parallel to the top and bottom floor. So that is spanned by the I and the J direction. So car IJ is one, whereas the other possibility is spanned by the I and the K direction. There's no such piece, so that variable is zero. Okay, so we have that uh, this correlation uh, surface variables. And uh, finally, we have also got constraints on them to, to prove that um, they indeed implement this stabilizer or satisfy this stabilizer up to the measurement, uh, up to the measurement results to correct the sign. The first one is um, you have the boundary condition when uh, it is at some ports. Um, so ports just are open-ended pipes. Uh, you can have cardinal surfaces connecting the two red faces and the two Z, uh, two Z faces. So that depends on in the poly string of uh, in the stable uh, in the in the stabilizer, which is a poly string, whether you have X or Z in. Uh, for this pipe. And you can also have identity. Then it means none of these two piece should be there. Or you can have Y, which means both of these two should be there. Um, and uh, let's maybe first look at part D. That is easier. So this is what you, uh, what happened at a Z, uh, at a Y cube because there's either a cube is either a Y cube or it is uh, a regular cube. So a regular cube, it doesn't really matter because the case is deduced from all the other pipes. For Y cubes, there are some specific requirements. So either both of the correlation surfaces are here or none of them are here. Okay, and then a and D, these are what we call boundary conditions because they are either at an open-ended port or it's a specific cube. For the junctions, which means this cube in the middle are just regular cubes, uh, and uh, you have a number of pipes going in this junction, we have two cases depending on uh, whether the correlation surface is perpendicular or parallel to the normal direction. So part B, this is the case for parallel correlation surface at a non YQ. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned previously, you have a uh, even parity of the total number of pieces for this junction. In this example, you have uh, two of them are here and one of them are missing. So that's an even parity. You can also have zero. Or for a four-way junction, you can have four pieces. Uh, and that's basically all the cases because you cannot have five or more pipes to a junction. 
for orthogonal surfaces, uh, so in this figure, the normal direction is a K. And as you can see, this surface in the IJ direction and it's orthogonal to the normal direction. It's all or nothing. So you can have none of these three pieces or all of them are here. Okay. So we have introduced all the variables, all the constraints. Um, all the variables are Boolean. All the constraints can be expressed in Boolean logic. Um, we just build the satisfiability instance from those constraints. Um, what we actually implemented uh, is summarized as below. We have uh, the last input specification, which is in the JSON file. Again, that specification includes the allowed volume of the subroutine, the ports, the stabilizers. And we use these three for a set encoding and simplification. Because what uh, the constraints I introduced previously, they're not exactly in the set syntax. So set can only be CNF, but we have used some other things like implies and so on. So this way is going to do that um, translation. I mean, we can also do it manually, but this way has some very handy building simplification. So we have that simplified set instance, which is in the format of Dimax. That is the standard format to specify set instance. And we actually use another solver called Keyset to solve this side instance. Um, and after we get a solution, we plug in this uh, set, set solution in Z3 and solve the variables Z3 simplified away because um, it doesn't really note what variables is simplified away and uh, so we, that's why we need to solve it again. But the key set solution already have uh, did the main heavy lifting. So the, this second solving is just, uh, it's extremely fast because this way is basically just doing the simplification again. Finally, we have some post-processing. Um, we print away some of the unnecessary structures. So those, mainly are some donuts in the pipe diagram that are co not connected to any of the ports. Um, they can exist because the SAS solver does not aim to reduce the donut in any way. Those are valid constructions, although not necessary. Um, so we scan for those structures that are not connected to any of the ports and then we print those away. We also, infer the color of the K pipes. As I mentioned, we, we don't have the color variables for the K pipes because we have the domain wall operation. So we can switch the orientation in K pipes uh, to, to fit in the color of the IJ pipes below and above. But in the end, we, we, we need those colors. So we infer them here. Um, by inferring the the domain operations, and we have a few outputs possibilities. Um, the main one is our last representation called laser. These are just all the variable values of the structural and the college surface variables. And from there, we can generate ZX diagrams or the 3D modeling files um, with, within the GLTF specification. Actually, the few pipe diagrams I've shown here are generated by the solver. And uh, we inspect it in some um, GLTF viewer, and then we just take a screenshot. To perform optimization with this, um, synthesizer because the set solver only tells us set or unset, right? In, in the set case, it has a solution, but it doesn't perform this uh, iterative 
optimization, uh, what we can do is that we first have some baseline design and then we reduce the solution space by de maybe decreasing the max i or j or k in the specification. So we generate the specification again. Um, or you can do some finer refinements like forbidding certain cubes at certain places. Uh, in any way, it's a reduction of the solution space. We query the sins again. So we go through this again. Uh, and if it is satisfiable, we have a better optimized design and we may do this again until we hit unsatisfiable. That's when we know um, the design is optimal. And that is up to our optimization pass. If you take some other pass like you uh, reduce solution space in some other way, then you may have better, better results. So that optimality is up to this optimization pass. So if it's unset, we know it's optimal, we just output the previous set result. That's how you can perform optimization. Okay, so let's look at some evaluation. The first set of evaluation we did is on graph state generation. What are graph states? So these are states that can be described by a graph. You have the qubits as the vertices, and then you have some edges between uh, among these qubits. The graph state is the quantum state with stabilizers x, i, and then z on each of the neighbor of i. So each graph corresponds to graph states. Um, in this example, you have, so we just go through the stabilizers focusing on each vertex. You have vertex zero, and then it only has one neighbor seven. So you have x on zero and z on seven. And maybe let's look at vertex six. It has neighbor five and seven. So then you have a stabilizer x six and z on its neighbors five and seven. So you have eight vertices, you have eight stabilizers. And since you have eight qubits, eight stabilizers that uniquely define a quantum state, that is a graph state corresponding to this graph. Um, part B is the result generated by lessons. And um, you have eight ports. Those are the, so, at, at these eight ports, you have the graph, you have the wanted graph state. Uh, the rest of the structure is the protocol to generate it. So we used two layers of operations. Um, uh, so, the, so the port, it, it's not an actual uh, operation, right? So it's just uh, say that at that point you can take this eight thing, eight tiles and do whatever you want later on. So we have two layers of operations and we use, uh, we have eight by two that many tiles, right? So we have, uh, we have this uh, row, uh, we have this row front and the back row. So two rows, each row have eight tiles, and then we have two uh, layer of operations. So that will be two times two times eight. That's 32 units of space time. Here our unit means uh, is a, a D by D tile going through D rounds of error correction. So that is a space time unit. We have 32 of those. Our baseline um, is some other compiler we cited in the paper, and uh, they have actually slightly different, um, slightly different assumptions. So they use this uh, two tile patches. So each patch will be a logical qubit, and they use two tiles for per patch. And the benefit of this is that you have both 
the Z operator and the X operator uh, available on one side of the patch. So what they're imagining is that they also have two rows and each row will contain eight of these patches. Um, since each patch is two tiles, so they actually have 16 tiles per row. They have two rows. And then they are basically just going to um, using the ancilla, which is the front row of these patches to directly measure these uh, stabilizers. Um, and this is the comparison of the result. The two lines are the space-time volume. Uh, as we can see, the, the Lassins, which is called a uh, synthesizer here, is uh, better than the baseline in terms of space and volume. So lower is better. And our main, uh, main advantage is that we use this more compact, uh, more compact tile for each logical qubit. And we're still able to access this X and Z operators, you know, with this complicated uh, winding pipes instead of um, a more intuitive approach. Um, and uh, the yellow bars are the runtime corresponding to each graph. So these are 101 graphs for eight qubits. And uh, it is actually a comprehensive data set because you can, um, you can assign graph states into equivalence classes up to local cliffers, which are the one cubic cliffers. Uh, it turns out there are only 101 of these equivalent cl equivalence classes, and we pick one representative from each of the class. And you can see that um, there are some spikes that corresponds nicely to the higher, higher run times of um, so, so these are actually um, the, opti uh, the optimization process start with height equals to two. So that two layers of oper operation, but it finds out that it is impossible to find a solution there. Uh, and then they progress to height equals to three. And that takes, so actually proving that two is not satisfiable will take a lot of time and then once it increases to three, it is satisfiable. But it is also valuable information because we know that three is optimal because two is unsatisfiable. And uh, another thing to notice is that for this baseline approach, they use a uh, maximum independent set as a, uh, as a subroutine to assign this uh, um, assign this logical op uh, measurements uh, to a few layers. So we actually allow the same time, the same duration for their MS, which is MP hard, as our set solving, which is which is also MP hard. So we are trying to be fair uh, in the comparison and we have this advantage. The second example in the evaluation is the majority gate. So this is uh, the port requirement. Um, so this setting appeared in the previous paper uh, for Shor's algorithm and they're, they need this majority gate um, and they have the six uh, input and outputs uh, aligned in some way. They also have the CCZ uh, as a non clifford resource and they require this sports location in some way. Uh, and this is our result. We are 40% more efficient in space time volume than what's provided in that paper. And um, so I just provide an example here. If you try to interpret this result with ZX calculus, it is pretty complicated. Um, you can, 
map each cube to a ZX spider and each of uh, and connect them with the with the edges. So those are each pipe is an edge. For the domain wall operation, it's a uh, hard mart on that edge. And by applying this uh, ZX rules, like we first merge some of the some of the spiders, and then we kind of morph the location of these spiders, and we apply this generalized hop through twice, and then we can prove that it is equivalent to what we started with, which is part B. This is the ZX diagram of the. Uh, of this majority gate. But yeah, as you can see, this is highly non-trivial for a human being. Okay, so probably the most interesting evaluation is for the T-factory, and we just focus on the 15 to 1 T-factory. Um, what we did is that we derived the stabilizers before the T-dagger in this quantum circuit. And uh, it is actually uh, just uh, some read Mahler code. Uh, we derive we can derive those stabilizers from the circuit or from the definition of the read Mahler code, as so. And then this will be the stabilizer appearing in our specification of the lattice surface subroutine, which has sixteen ports. You have fifteen ports where uh, a physical T injection is happening, and then you have an output port. This is our result. Um, the white box is the T-injection. And it turns out that when you perform this T-injection to a surface code tile, you always, it, it's undeterminist. You either inject the T or you inject T dagger. And in the case that you inject T dagger, you need to have this uh, green box as uh as fix up so that basically uh apply an S gate so you can flip the T dagger to T. And these are dynamic uh because you don't know whether it's going to be a T or T dagger before it's finished. So the green box and this gray pipe, these are this dynamic S fix up. And those together with the white boxes. So that is the whole T injection. So we chose to perform these injections at the top layer of the pipes. And then you can also see that we, in the end, we have an output sticking up. This is the assumption of the optimization. And we believe that uh, the previous state of the art was 172, and we managed to reduce it to 162. So if we're not considering this uh, S-fix-up, we have uh, much, uh, we have some more degrees of freedom of performing this uh, distillation. So for example, in this previous work, it's using a 11-patch floor plane and uh, it is spending 11, uh, 11 layers of operation. So the total volume is 121. And uh, we managed to find a 99 volume solution. So that's three by three, nine patch floor plane. And then we have nine layers of operation. But here the T injections happens um, like from the side. So you just assume that somehow you inject a T state here deterministically, and uh, then you uh, you can have this 99 volume design. So for the uppercase, we have 8% improvement over the state of the art, and for the lowercase, we have 18% improvement over the state of the art. These are under some different assumptions. Finally, um, a note on the runtime of the uh, of the tool, because after all, we're making use of set solving, and 
it's very hard to guarantee the runtime. We managed to derive these solutions that are valuable. Uh, so that means our, at least our approach can get to some interesting scale. And this table shows some data on the runtime. We have the majority gate, we have the 99 volume factory, uh, 121 volume factory, basically just rederiving what, uh, what's in the previous paper. And we have the 162 um, volume T factory. So a kind of metric is how large this, uh, how, how, how many of these variables are there. And um, that is, as I said, the dominating set of variables are the collision surface variables. And those are the number of those variables are proportional to the number of stabilizers and stab times the space time volume V. And um, we have this many for these four cases. However, when we generate the set instance, this resolver will bring away some of these uh, variables. And uh, the variables and clauses here uh, in this table are uh, after we get a simplified set problem, how many variables and clauses are there? And um, we have uh, we actually solve this each of this problem for twenty times because the set solver has some randomness inside, and we record minimum time uh, here because we if you have this resource, you have twenty. For example, you have twenty core CPU. You can just run everything the, um, in parallel, and then whenever you get the first result back, then you know you're done. You you can kill the others. So we record the minimum time of those twenty instances, and we also record the standard deviation of runtime on those twenty instances. And something very interesting. Um, which quite speaks a lot of the randomness in size solver, for example, the minimum time to solve the 162 volume factory is 400 some seconds, and the standard deviation is 4,000 seconds. So you can have some crazy long runtime when you're out of luck uh, with the randomness in the size solver. But in general, I think a good metric is the number of variables and clauses. Um, when you have the set instance, that is mostly how how hard a set instance is. Okay, so finally, some outlook on the on this project. Uh, first, we can use the things more because the benefit of having this automatic tool is to replace human efforts. You can run this in parallel with a lot of different configurations at the same time, right? Uh, human can de delegate a lot of work to this tool. And it's also nice because there is the results are correct by construction. And we may need to consider some better set solving techniques, maybe some approximate approaches like MaxSet. Uh, or some more efficient encoding into set variables other than what's uh, in, what's in the formulation right now. We, uh, there's, so for, for now, all the port configurations are given in the specification. And in some cases, um, we can have some flexibility, um, like, for example, in the T factory, you have 15 injections and one output port. And those 15 inje uh, injection ports are actually quite symmetric because it just takes in a T injection. And there are also some uh, symmetry in the stabilizers of those 15 ports. And how to explore these symmetries automatically, uh, because when you are projecting it, uh, onto the 3D space time, you break some of the symmetry, right? If you want to be completely symmetric, then you have to go to a 15 dimension space, but we are only a space, uh, we're only a three dimension space. So after you break the symmetry, um, 
some of this permutation permutation of the ports will lead to better solutions and how to automatically explore that is an open question. And we may consider supporting other operations than uh, what we have so far. Like what we have so far are uh, the, except the basic ones are like the domain wall operation and the, uh, the Y basis operation. But if you if there's some very efficient operations, maybe it's so I'll consider those to get those into the formulation. Uh, and the theory on attaching magic state injections to ledger surgery subroutine is also an uh, interesting problem because um, if we assume that each injection leads to either T or T dagger, um, then we don't necessarily need that S fix up immediately above this injection. So in the 15 to 2, 1 case, uh, actually you don't necessarily need 15 of these fix ups. Sometimes you can do uh, with less than 15 and it doesn't need to be immediately above each injection. So immediately above each injection and we do it for each injection. This is our uh, current kind of naive approach uh, of making sure that this works. Uh, and there are some flexibilities uh, that can lead to better designs, but even with our naive approach, we can see there's still improvements over uh, previous human state of the art. And finally, the generated designs from Lessins can be integrated into um, the algorithm level FTQC compiler. This marks the end of our second part, the technical details, and we're going to look at the code base. The code corresponding to this paper can be found on Zenodo. I included a DOI link in the paper itself. And um, I downloaded and expand the zip file into this directory. It's got 24 slash scalpel. I open it up in VS Code here. It's uh, this is from my MacBook. There are some there is a readme file with some installation instructions. And um, I recommend you to use uh, Python virtual environment. So I'm going to create one. Python, I'm using Python 3.8. Um, a later version should work. Previous version might work, but I didn't test extensively into which Python version. So great. And we're going to enter that virtual environment. And in this isca 24 sescalpo directory, I'm going to have pip install dot. We'll install a few things. Mainly you need a ZHC solver. You need network X, have Steam. Um, and Python kernel so that we can use Jupyter Notebook. So installation is complete. Now let's go into docs, demo. This is a minimal demo on how to use the software. Um, since we have just talked about the paper, we are going to skip the introduction. And... Uh, Okay, so we're trying to construct the specification for this CNOT example. We're going to use this virtual environment we just created. So in the I and J direction, we allow two units of space time. In the K direction, the time direction will allow three. And 
we construct the ports. There are four ports, the input and uh, the input of the control and the target, the output of the control and target. So the input are on the bottom. So the, the K uh, coordinate is zero and the output are on the top. So K coordinate is three. The stabilizers, we have Z, uh, the four stabilizers that define the C naught. Our package is called Lessins, and uh, there is this class called the Lattice Surgery Synthesizer. We initialize it, and uh, we there is a method called dot solve. Um, we need to have this argument specification, and we have we pass in input dictionary that is the specification we just created. And finally, we show the result. Let's see what happens. So result on its own is a, it's an object from another class called Lattice Surgery Solutions. And we don't get any visualization so far. Um, we can directly access the laser, which is the representation, um, text representation with dot laser. You can see there are the number of I the number of units in I axis, in J axis, in K axis, number of um, ports, number of stabilizers, the configuration of the ports, the stabilizers, and then we have the array of variables we defined. X is I, X is J, X is K, color I, color J. Node Y, correlation surfacing IJ, IK, JK, JI, KI, KJ. And that is our representation of the Latin service subroutine. So we can perform some um, post processing. Like I mentioned previously, we have print away some unconnected structures and also. Um, color the K pipes. So these are called after default optimizations on the result object. And we can, after these optimizations, we can save the laser representation. As you can see, we generate some JSON file. And we can also save, uh, export this result to the GLTF format. It is a widely used 3D modeling format. So this is the GLTF file. It's probably uh, not meaningful to read it directly. It is in, uh, fundamentally a JSON file. And uh, there are some packages to preview it. Look at uh, okay. Um, so first we have this axis. So uh, I J K are the R G B uh, axis, right? So I J K, and then you have the pipes. Okay, and um, we can also export this result to a ZX diagram. Um, we have used some script here in the Steam ZX directory that is taken from the, the Steam uh, GitHub repo. And that directory contains some function that takes in a ZX diagram and calculate the stabilizer uh, on, the, on the ports of that diagram. So we can compare, so we can first export our result with the X diagram and uh, use Steam ZX to calculate those stabilizers. And then we can compare these stabilizers with what we started with, which are the stabilizers in the specification. And they should be uh, generating, so these are all generator of the stabilizer group of this 
let us say subroutine and they should be generating the same group. And how we check is basically um, each of the resulting stabilizer should be commuting with uh, all the specified stabilizer. And indeed, these two are equivalent. Okay, so when we when we were solving for the last previously, we are actually using the internal set solver of Z3. And in our experience, um, you can use some other set solvers to, to derive the results faster. Uh, we support the key set solver. What you need to do is that when you initialize this lattice surgery synthesizer object, uh, you say solver is key set, and then you need to specify the directory. So let's check on my system. He said executable binary is in user local binary. So we just copy it here. So this can be any directory where key set is. And then we, again, invoke the solve method uh, with specification input dictionary. And uh, there is a flag called whether you want to print details. You can also turn this on uh, even if the solver is not key set, but we we didn't uh, previously, we turn it on now. And we can save the Dimax file. That is uh, when Z3 simplified the problem and then generate the set to pass it to key set. And then we can save that set instance in the Dimax file. And we can also save the printout of the key set solver uh, that's, uh, with this set log file argument in the, in the solve method. So let's run it. And you have some printout here. And since we specified these file names, you also save that to a cnow.dimax. So this is a dimax file. Uh, it's a CNF with uh, 462 variables and uh, 2,000 some constraints. Um, and then this is just following the standard format of specifying a C not, uh, specifying a set instance. And here we save the printout of the key set solver. Um, it is recording some progress during the solving process. And then it will tell us the solution of the set instance. So this problem is satisfiable. And then uh, each of these lines say whether each variable is true or false. So the first variable is true, the second variable is false in the solution. And so on, you can get some statistics of running the set solver here. Okay, so internally, Lacins will parse this uh, key set result uh, to, to derive the whether each variable is true or false in the set instance. And then again, we use the Z3 solver because the set instance is not a one, the variables in the set instance is not one-to-one -to, -one to the variables in our formulation because Z3 had processed it. So we let this resolve again. That that solving is really really fast because he's had already solved all the others for for Z three. Um, and the final result is uh, is stored in the result here. Like we can also query something like result laser. And or uh, or all the other things. So this is the minimum example of using the software. We can take a look at the structure. 
Uh, oh, by the way, the result directory contains all the main result we show in the paper. For example, you have this uh, GLTI file of the 99, uh, 99s volume factory that is our baseline under one assumption. So you can see input uh, of each actions and also on the bottom and output here. Um, and the other factories and majority gate and also um, there is a CSV file of the graph state generation results. You have ID of the graph state equivalence class, the number of edges, the optimal depths lessons got and the runtime in seconds. So that's the result directory, the Steam CX directory, as we said, it's taken from uh, the GitHub repo Steam. The link is attached here. And we have the main directory, which is, oh, and the results directory can, uh, the results here can be uh, reproduced with the file is got 24 underscore graph state dot py. This is the script, uh, how we perform the experiments. And then others contains the majority gate and the three, the three factories. So if you run this, it will reproduce the results. But um, note that the runtime uh, can differ. As I mentioned in in the in the table of runtime, the standard deviation of multiple runs of the same uh, set solving can vary a lot because of the randomness in the set solver. So eventually, you will get these results. You will reproduce these results, but it may take different runtime when you try it uh, on different cores or at different times of the day. And also. Because we have that degree of freedom, all the Z pipe, uh, all the K pipes are not colored. Uh, you can have different correct results with respect to the same specification. So also don't be surprised if um, if you run this twice, the final rendered pipes looks different. Okay, so the main directory called lessons. Um, since it's a package, you have some of these init files. That is surgery synthesis.py. This is the this contains the main two classes. That is surgery solution and that is surgery synthesizer. With the synthesizer, you can specify some problems, specify how you want to solve it, and the return will be a lattice surgery solution. So with synthesizer, you have soft method, optimized steps method, uh, tri band permutation methods, soft all port permutation methods. Um, these two, we didn't really use it in the evaluation, but it's going, you can specify um, permuting the ports in some way. And then, um, for example, you, you can try to permute the 15 input ports of the T factory with this method. And when you get a value solution, you get this object lattice surgery solution. Um, you can get depths of it. You can um, remove the disconnected pieces. That's the pruning post-processing I mentioned. You can color the K-pipes. And the default optimization is just applying these two for T factory, um, there's also attach fix ups. That is because of the undeterministic behavior of the T injection. So we need to attach those uh, uh, fix up ports. We can check the laser. You you can initialize the solution with some existing laser file, um, and uh, but but then. 
if it is not generated by our solver, maybe it's violating some constraints. So we can, uh, oh, we can, we can check that file. You can also save the, the solution to some file. You can export it to the 3D GLTF modeling file. You can export it to uh, an URL that, and then that URL is pointing you to this project by Craig called Zigzag. And uh, you can also generate some text diagram. So this looks like the 2D time slices in some way. You can export this to a network X graph. That is just the ZX graph with some, uh, so that some information of the, uh, in the ZX language is an, uh, annotations on that network X graph. And from that graph, you can invoke the verify stabilizer with Steam ZX method. So this is uh, this file. And this file is mainly a wrapper around set synthesis that is surgery set. So this file contains the essential um, building of the formulation. So build as empty model. Uh, I'm not going to go through each of these one by one, but uh, you can see like you have a lot of method starting with constraint. Those are uh, building up each set of constraints. So for example, we forbid the 3D corner and you use this method to add some constraints to the goal. So that is the total formulation. So this method correspond to one to one to the uh, to the validity and cor correlation surface constraints I mentioned earlier. You can check whether this model is satisfiable with Z three, or you can check with key set. Um, it's going to have a, a few other helper method. And finish this file. The rewrite passes. These are just the three uh, post processing we mentioned earlier. We can attach the fix ups that's specific for the T factory. And uh, for the coloring of the K pipes, because we didn't color the K pipes in the formulation, and we removed unconnected structures from the solution because they are unnecessary. Um, the two, um, let's talk about translators first. So we can generate a 3D modeling file in the GLTF format. We can generate a network X graph with some annotations. So th those are just going to be the ZX diagram and we can generate a text figure or uh, ZX grid graph. So this is mainly for generating URL in the ZigZag website. And from the network X generator, we can verify stabilizers by making use of Steam ZX. That's basically it for the code base. And this is going to be integrated into the glue directory in the Steam project maintained by Crack. And uh, we are going to update it from time to time if we find necessary. This will be the end of uh, this talk on our ISCA 24 paper, uh, SAS Galco for lattice surgery representation and synthesis of subroutines for surface call photon and quantum computing. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact the authors and I thank you for your attention.